Hey guys, welcome to another class. Today we are going over chapter two of our textbook, The Constitution and Its Origins. All right, what is this picture of? In this picture you can see, um, if you don't know already, it starts with we the people, right? Yes, this is um, a picture of our document, The Constitution. And you can see article one. How many articles are there in total? There are seven, so you can see the first one right there. And this part right here is a preamble. It starts with we the people. We'll get into that a little bit more. Um, today, I just want you to relax and enjoy a story I'm going to tell. And this is a story of the birth of the greatest nation, the United States, our country. Um, but before I do that, let's get into the pre-revolution period. And I just want to give you the political background of before the revolution, ever took place. And the revolution um, is when we broke away from Britain, right? This is when we were a part of Britain, when Britain sent um, the first explorers and the colonists to to take over um, the, the new Americas, right? So after they did that in 1776, colonists, right? And these are British colonists who came to America. Um, and now these colonists living in America, we call them American colonists uh, too, but they've been living under the rule of the British government for more than a century, for more than a hundred years. By 1776, uh, these colonists have already built inroads and uh, their own sort of um, culture and system and style um, in, in, the, the, in the colonies, right? Um, and this is uh, the what is now the East Coast of the United States. And each colony had established its own legislature. Did you know that? Uh, to which men were elected to make laws for their fellow colonists living in the America, right? And during this time, taxes that were imposed by England were very low. Property ownership, were more widespread in America than in England during this time. And in 1760s and the early 1770s, most colonists were very happy being members of the British Empire. And they had no desire at this point uh, to be an independent nation. They considered themselves British, I guess, people, British citizens, right? Um, colonists identified as British, not American. I think that's an interesting point um, to just remember, right? Moving on. Okay, moving on. So what changed? Why did they decide to break away from Britain? And I'm gonna move here to a laser pointer. All right. Here is the pre-revolutionary period again. Here's a map. Um, and during the pre-revolution, period, there was what was called a seven years war, right? Um, if you can see in this map real quick, you can see that here in the pink or the red, this is Great Britain, okay? This is the territory held by Great Britain. And because this was sort of like undiscovered land, it wasn't established, right? People, other uh, colonizing powers during this time was trying to were trying to compete to get as much territory as possible. So another competing colonial power during this time was France. So here is in blue, you can see in the legend here that this part was taken over by the French, by France. And then here is so far in purple is territories that were ceded, that were given up by France to Great Britain. Um, in the treaty uh, that the treaty of nine, of 1713. So these are um, areas that the French had already given up to um, to Britain. And in the orange here, you can see that this is territory uh, that was um, controlled by Spain, the Spanish. Okay. And the other parts here in the gray are still are just you know frontier land, right? Okay. So during this time, you can see that there is a boundary between the British here in the pink and then the French possessions in North America. Um, and this boundary was 
was still largely undefined. Like there were still skirmishes over, you know, setting up this boundary, right? And during this time, the French began constructing a chain of forts. They began constructing a military fort to assert their claim um, to make a clear demarcation, to make a clear line between the British and pink and then their own territory in blue. So they wanted to set up like a territory, a border, okay, a border. So during this time, led by George Washington, who later became our first American president, during this time, George Washington uh, was part of the British colonial militia. And he went into a part of the French territory in the year 1754, and he killed 10 Frenchmen, all right? And in response to this, the French, they retaliated. Uh, and, that, and these were the first engagements of what would become a Seven Years' War, okay? And in 1763, the Seven Years' War between Great Britain, right, on one hand, and the French came ultimately to an end when Great Britain gained control of most of the French territory in North America. So after the Seven Years' War, the great victor was Great Britain. So Great Britain ended up taking over mo most of the French territory in North America, in this North American continent. So what was the significance Right? What was the importance of the Seven Years' War? Well, what ended up happening was in North Korea, in North, I keep trying to say North Korea, North America, the issue of what would dominate the continent of this North American continent was now resolved. It wouldn't be French speaking, it would be what? Yes, you're right. It would be English speaking because it is now controlled, and the victors of the Seven Years' War was Great Britain and the expulsion, the kicking out of, the, of France from North America had the unintended impact of making the English colonists living in America feel less dependent on Britain for security. George Washington had learned that many of the important command principles from the British regular officials that he marched during the Seven Years' War and the Seven Years' War is also known as the French and Indian War, okay? George Washington, he witnessed firsthand how vulnerable the British formulations could be in the rough timbered frontier land that predominated in North America. Because if you think about it, the American colonists, right? The, uh, they knew the terrain. They knew um, what it looked like on the ground because they've been living there for over a century. And when you had British forces that came into um, America and tried to help with uh, winning this war against the French, it was really George Washington and his militia, the British militia living in America, that understood uh, what the force looked like, what the ground looked like, what the mountains looked like, what the terrain looked like, right? So the colonists saw uh, the inadequacies, the weaknesses of the British colonial administration. And they also saw the effectiveness of their own colonial militias, militias meaning their own sort of like ragtag men of um, who, were, who were in the army, right? And they also saw the need of cooperation among the colonies that settled in North America, okay? So, during this time, uh, tensions began to grow, and these tensions between now the American colonists versus Great Britain started to grow, and this eventually led to the Revolutionary War. Okay, and the Revolutionary War is we led a re American colonist led a revolution against Great Britain, right, to form um, to be independent and to form their own to form their own government. So. Look here, on the first point, the Seven Years' War had been very costly to Britain. So the British began to tax the American colonists to pay its debts from the war, okay? And the American colonists were not very happy about that, right? The colonists had not consented to direct taxation. They did not give their approval, right? Um, they did not sign up to get direct taxation from the British. 
And these taxes were established without any consent by the colonists. And this eventually helped lead fuel anti-British feeling, anti-British sentiment. All right. And the American Revolution, it broke out in two years after the Seven Years' War. And the American Revolution was a colonial revolt, um, which occurred between 1765 and 1783. And the British patriots in the 13 colonies, what, what ended up happening, right? You guys all know, because we are now the United States of America, we're independent from Great Britain. But we defeated the British in the American Revolutionary War. Um, if we did not win the American Revolutionary War, it would have gone down in British textbooks saying, oh, this was the American Rebellion, right? Uh, but we, it was not a rebellion, right? We ultimately won. And so we won the American Revolutionary War. And what actually, what actually ended up happening is that we got, America, we got the assistance from France. Isn't that funny? Because we had fought them um, in the Seven Years' War. Uh, but we got assistance, Americans, American colonists got assistance from France to defeat the British. Um, and we ultimately won independence from Great Britain and established what is now known as the United States of America. So the American Revolution, what were the grievances? What were the main um, complaints of the American colonists against the British government, right? What were the key developments in the outbreak of the American Revolution? So let's, let's take a look at this. And I kind of explained it in the previous slide, but one of the main things you should remember was that they were not given representation in the British Parliament. That is key. And added to that, the second point is, is that they did not have, there was no taxation without representation. The American colonists believed that they should not be taxed without having any sort of representation in the British Parliament. Right now, um, there were, during this time, there were taxes. The British taxes levied upon the American colonists on stamps, on sugar, on tea, in order to repay the British debt for the American defense, right? Um, and in doing so, many colonists viewed the British king and the British parliament were abusing them and depriving them of their rights. So because of this, on July 14th, 1776, the American colonists, they declared they declared their independence through the Declaration of Independence. And they wrote a document and they signed it, right? And in this document, you guys have the very famous words, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men and women are created equal and they are endowed by their creator because they believed in God with certain unalienable rights. What does unalienable mean? It means these are rights that cannot be taken away because these were given to them by their creator, by God, right? So these are natural rights, rights that they're born with. And among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And it goes on. It says that to secure these rights, rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, the ability to be able to achieve happiness in the American dream, right? Governments are instituted among men, de deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. That the government, the governmental power comes uh, from the people, that the people give their consent, give their permission and approval to be governed by the government, right? And it says here that whenever any form of government comes destructive to these ends, that if there is a form of government that is destructive to the people for them to have life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, right? Then it is the right of the people to alter, to change or abolish, get rid of the current government and to institute 
a new government. That's what it says in the Declaration of Independence. And what it's talking about here is that because the current government, the British government, were in their minds, they believed were abusing them of their God-given rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, um, that they had the right to form their own government and to break away from the British government. All right? And this, these are words written by Thomas Jefferson in the Declaration of Independence. And this is a figure 2.5 in your textbook. And here you see a picture, um, and it's a presentation of the Declaration of Independence. And it's being commemorated in a painting by John Trumbull in 1817. Uh, and this was commissioned to hang in the Capitol in Washington, D.C. So um, this was a picture sort of um, remembering the moment of the Declaration of Independence. But hold on one second. These ideas of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, where did these modern political ideas, right, regarding the relationship between the government and the people's natural rights, which were believed to be God-given rights to life, liberty, and property, where did these ideas come from? It's a very important um, question. And it came from a political philosopher. Where did these core political values come from? It came from John Locke, who was a 17th century English philosopher. And he described that humans had a natural right that had been granted by God and thus could never be taken away by other human beings, even royal ones, or by the government. And these God-given rights included, and I said, life, liberty, and property, right? Because um, the pursuit of happiness is through acquire, could be um, acquiring property for yourself and for your family, right? And life is defined, and property meaning private property. These are not properties that are owned by the government, but that private citizens um, can acquire private property for themselves. And life is defined, right? God-given rights to life, right? We have the right not to be harmed of our physical bodies, right? And liberty is defined as the state of being free within society from oppressive restrictions imposed by the authority on one's way of life, behavior, and political views, right? And we have the liberty to practice our religion, um, to have our political views, to have the freedom of speech, right? These are liberties that the Americans believed that can never be taken away by by the government. These are natural rights that we hold, um, that are given to us by God, right? And what does property mean? Um, property is defined as that humans have the right to own property, and once you own it, the government had the duty to protect each person's property, right? And that's why we have law enforcement, um, like the police, uh, to make sure that each person's property is secure, that the government should secure um, property held by people. And the government themselves cannot take over our property, cannot seize our property, um, and just say that it belongs to the government. Moving on, John Locke also had this idea. So we talked about the natural rights um, that humans have. But let's talk about where does governmental power, governmental power, where does this come from, right? And John Locke talks about the social contract. And the social contract is a agreement between the people and the government. And this agreement, um, the idea behind the social contract is this, that the people will sacrifice a small portion of their freedom and be, and and agree to be ruled by the government in exchange for the government's protection of their life, liberty, and property, right? So people will give up a bit of their freedom um, to consent to be ruled by the government, right? In exchange for the government's protection of their life, liberty, and property. But 
Here's a caveat. If the government deprives the people of their rights, of these rights, life, liberty, and property, by abusing the power that were given to the government by the people, then this social contract is essentially broken, right? And the people are no longer bound to obey the government or bound by its terms, right? The people can thus withdraw their consent to obey the government and to form another government for their protection. And this you can read more about on page 39 of your textbook. Uh, so you can see here that there was a desire to limit the power of the government. There was a desire for the people to limit the power of the government because the American colonists, they saw that if the government got too big and they saw that the British government, they believed in their minds the British government got too big and they overstepped their bounds. Um, then they believed that the people, the, the desire to limit the government is cl closely related to the idea that the people should be able to govern themselves, right? That they give a small amount of power over to the government to protect their lives, liberty, and property, but everything else, the people had their power to govern themselves and to rule themselves and to make decisions for themselves, that the government should not get too big. So here's a picture of John Locke. This is what he looked like, and you can see him here. And he wrote a book called The Second Trius of the Government in 1689. And, uh, and he wrote about the social contract, which states that government should protect people's lives, liberty, and private property, and that the people had the right to overthrow a government if it was unjust or tyrannical. So that's those are the two main points of the social contract. So the Declaration of Independence in 1776, it was drafted by Thomas Jefferson. It officially proclaimed the colony's separation from Britain. And he, God, he wrote, had given everyone the rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. People had created governments to protect these rights and consented to be governed uh, by them as long as the government functioned as intended. And this is on page 42 of your book. However, um, if there is any form of government that becomes destructive, right, that does not uphold, right, um, everyone's rights to life, liberty, and property, and the pursuit of happiness, then it is the right of the people to alter or abolish the government and to institute a new one. Jefferson, he charged that the British king had taxed the colonists without their consent of their elected representatives, and that they interfered with their trade and denied them the right to trial by jury and deprived them of their right to self-government. So they wrote this Declaration of Independence and with the signing of the Declaration of Independence, the founders of the United States committed themselves to a creation of a new kind of government. So the question is, what would this new government look like, right? So they now broke away from the British government. When they create a new government, what is that going to look like? Are they going to set up the, a new, and the British government was, um, the power was, was a monarchy. Were they going to set up their own king? Was George Washington going to, the general, right, um, the lead general in the, in the Revolutionary War against Great Britain, are people going to make him, appoint him as the king and to set up their own version of the monarchy? The question is no. The answer is no. So the founding fathers, they thought of a new idea. Right? And this was the founding of the American government during this time. You got to know that most countries had like a monarchy, right? A king that led them. But they set up, they wrote a document called the Articles of Confederation. And this was in 1781. And you can think of this as the first constitution of the United States. But you'll later see that the Articles of Confederation wasn't a strong enough document um, and idea and government to um, get a lot of the stuff that they needed done to run a country, right? So you can think of this as a first draft to the Constitution. Um, but it gave little power to the central government. Many worried that the central government would become too powerful, overbearing, and abuse rights of the individuals because that's what the British government did to them. So what the founding fathers did was they gave very little power to the central government. 
um, in the Articles of Confederation, right? So you can see here that a confederation was created, and this was an entity in which independent self-governing states, right, these 13 colonies, would form a union for the purpose of acting, acting together in areas such as defense. And you can read more about this in page 44 of your book. The Articles of Confederation created an alliance of sovereign states held together by a weak central government. And the most important decisions were left to individual state legislatures. So individual 13 colonies, their own state legislatures. It gave very little power to a national government that would rule over all 13 colonies, right? The Articles of Confederation, um, the powers given to the central government were very, were severely limited. And what did these include? There was no power to tax citizens by the national government, by the central government. Okay, national and central government, these are synonyms, right? They mean the same thing. So there's no power to tax citizens, only individual state governments, and at this time it was 13 colonies, right? Only they had the power to tax. And with no money, right, they couldn't pay for anything. They also lacked the power to regulate commerce among these 13 colonies that later became states, right? Um, the Articles of Confederation also outlined that the central government, also known as the national government, lacked the power to raise an army or navy. They also did not have a chief executive, meaning like a president sort of figure. There were no federal, right? Another word for federal is national, right? National judiciary courts, like the Supreme Court that we have now, only the individual 13 states had their own, you know, federal court system. There was no federal court system, right? And to pass any laws on the national level that would apply to all 13 states, there needed to be not a simple majority. What is a simple majority? A simple majority if 50 is 50% 50 plus one. But the threshold is higher. It was a super majority, as you can see here to pass laws, which was nine out of 13 states, right? And any amendment to the Articles of Confederation required not a simple majority, which is 50% plus one, not a super majority, which is nine out of 13 states, but it required an, the highest, th highest threshold, a unanimous, meaning every state had to approve any changes made to the Articles of Confederation. So it was very inflexible. So here in your textbook, I pulled this from the textbook, it's table 2.1. Here are some of the problems with the Articles of Confederation. Weaknesses of the Article of Confederation here is why was this a problem? The first one, the national government could not impose taxes on citizens. It could only request money from states. So if you just request money it's, and it's not mandatory, right? Then the requests for money were usually not honored because it was voluntary. Um, as a result, the national government did not have money to pay for national defense or to fulfill its other responsibilities as outlined in the Articles of Confederation. If, even for us on the individual level, right? If we had to pay our taxes and it was sort of voluntary. It was not mandatory that the national government could not impose taxes. Do you think we would freely give our pay taxes? Probably not, right? Another weakness of the Articles of Confederation, the national government could not regulate foreign trade. Foreign trade is trade with, let's say, France or Great Britain or other, uh, or Spain, right? Other other states, other countries, right? International countries. And they could not regulate interstate commerce. Interstate commerce means uh, trade between the 13 states. That the government, and why was this a problem? The government could not prevent foreign countries from hurting American competitors by shipping inexpensive products to the United States. It could not prevent states from passing laws 
that interfered with domestic trade. So there was no coordination um, as a whole, right? As um, a confederacy, um, as a union, right? To, to make deals um, and trade that would benefit the United States as a whole. The national government, another weakness of the Articles of Confederation is that the national government could not raise an army. It had to send requests to states to send men, right? And why was this a problem? State governments could choose not to honor Congress's request for troops, right? This would make it very hard to defend the nation. Another weakness, each state had only one vote in Congress regardless of its size. So if there are 13 states and some states were much populous, which much more huge in terms of not only territory, but the number of people that lived in that state, it didn't matter. Even the small states, right, that had little territory and had small number of people, um, each state had only one vote regardless of its size. And so this was a problem because the more populous states were less represented. Another weakness, the articles did not, could not be changed without a unanimous vote to do so. So this was a problem because problems with the articles cannot be easily fixed. All right. So here's the main point. The Articles of Confederation suffered from problems that could not be easily repaired. And the biggest problem was a lack of power given to the national government. Okay. Moving on. Here is a really fun comic. Um, that I found, and this is the Articles of Confederation. And it says here, in the Articles of Confederation, there's no president, no executive agencies, no judiciary, no tax base. There's, the people are asking for no army funding, no Navy funding, um, weak foreign policy, no trade policy, right? So the main person, right, here, what were we thinking, right? We didn't give any power to here, and it looks like a sad picture of the Articles of Confederation, right? Um, and the Articles of Confederation is feeling judged, right? And he's saying, well, it wasn't all bad though, right? Here's another fun comic. Um, the weaknesses of the Articles of Confederation. Here, the Articles of Confederation is um, symbolized as a ship, right? And it says here, Articles Confederation had no power to collect taxes. It showed that it had no power to raise an army. It had no national court system. It had no power to enforce um, treaties. It had no power to enforce laws. And here on the bottom, it says, rough sailing ahead, right? How can it sail effectively without having any sort of power? And you can see that the sails are not strung, it's sort of like bent over, right? So here's a picture uh, painted um, during the new Constitutional Convention of 1770, of 1787. And this was called to form a new government, right? Because the Articles of Confederation was too weak. The existing Articles of Confederation were too weak, so they called a convention, a conference, a meeting, to form a new government. And this new constitution, this new government, would need to be more powerful. All the while, though, not infringing on the rights of the people. Again, um, they wanted a new government, they wanted this government to be more powerful, but at the same time, um, the American people, they wanted to make sure that the government would not be too powerful to start infringing, violating the rights of the people, right? They, the people themselves wanted to maintain sovereignty to a certain extent and not give over too much power over to the government because they saw how dangerous and um, how a big government can try to abuse the rights of the people, right? So this was constantly on their mind. So before that, they before that they can have a new constitution, they had to settle some big issues, right? First off was the question of representation, and there were large states and there were small states, right? Um, in among the thirteen states, and 
this was the idea that there should be a federal supremacy, right? Federal meaning national, um, strong government, right? Versus state sovereignty, meaning state power. So they had this idea where each of the 13 states wanted their, they wanted to keep their own power to rule themselves, but also give a certain level of certain amount of power over to the national government that would rule over each of the individual 13 states so they can coordinate um, certain things on the national, on the federal level, right? So here there were two main plans that were offered that they were debating um, in this um, meeting. The first idea is that there should be a government based on the Virginia plan. And this was an idea that the legislature, um, the body that would make laws would be bicameral, would be two separate bodies. That representation should be based on population of each state. Uh, that the more population there is in a state, that there should be more representation. <coughs> Excuse me. That the role of the national government um, could legislate for states and to veto state law. But this is in juxtaposition. You can compare this to the New Jersey plan. The New Jersey plan is the idea that legislature on the national level um, would be unicameral, meaning one. That there should be representation that were state-based, that each state, each of the 13 states, would be equally represented regardless of size, regardless of the population. Um, so, and that the role of the national government, that their idea of the role of the national government would provide a defense, just a military defense against foreign powers, but would not override state authority, each of the 13 states. That, this was their idea, right? Two different ideas floating around um, and which idea will win out, right? We shall soon see. But first, I just want to share a quick chart of the population of each state during this time. And you can see that there is a huge spectrum, right? Delaware and Rhode Island and let's say Georgia were one of the smaller states, right, at 60 thousand people. And Virginia, Pennsylvania, and North Carolina, they had more populous states, right? Um, at, you know, hundreds of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people. So of course, if you look here, these populous states wanted more representation um, in the government, and these smaller states wanted to keep just one state would equal one vote in Congress, right? So which one did the United States adopt? Was it the Virginia plan or was it the New, New Jersey plan, right? And you can see in the Virginia plan, um, that was one of the bigger states, right? So they offered this plan based on population New Jersey, as you can see here. Uh, on this chart, they were one of the smaller states, so they wanted to um, gain more power by having just one state, one vote. So which one did the United States adopt? Well, they ended up compromising and they used elements from both the Virginia plan and the New Jersey plan. Uh, this was known as the Great Compromise on Representation. So what was the Great Compromise? Well, there were actually three main compromises. First was on representation, and we'll get into this. Second was a compromise on slavery. And third was a compromise on the national government's powers. Okay, let's get into this. Compromise number one was on representation, I said, right? So they decided to create a bicameral legislature, right? Two bodies of legislature. The first one would be known as the Senate, which we have now. And the Senate is that each state, regardless of size, regardless of how big they are in terms of territory and regardless of how populous each state is, would have two senators for equal representation at, as in the Virginia plan. And each senator would have um, six years uh, to serve in a term. And then you would have a House of Representatives 
and this representation would be based on population. And this would, this would be popularly elected by voters in each state as outlined in the Virginia plan. And each, uh, each elected official would have a two-year term, okay? Here is a picture of the national capital in Washington, D.C. And on this side is where the Senate meets. And on this side is where the House of Representatives meets. And both, if you combine both, it is known as what? If you said Congress, you're absolutely correct. These two uh, legislating bodies, this bic bicameral um, bicameralism, make up the United States Congress. So you have compromise number two, and this was slavery. This is because you have representation based on population, right? And during this time, there was slavery. There was a question of, well, should states, should slaves be counted, counted in um, as part of the population of a state so that each state would have more representation, right? So look here, when states took a census of their population to figure out how many House of Representatives each state should get, should get there was a debate on whether slaves should be counted, right? And this is on page 51. Southern states, right, and a lot of these southern states were slave-owning states, argued that slaves should be counted so that they get more representation in Congress, right? But northern states argued that, um, and a lot of these northern states did not uh, believe in slavery, right? Uh, so they argued against citing that representatives from southern states um, they argued against having any slaves be counted um, in the census that would give representation in the legislature because they argued that representatives from southern states would not represent the interests of the, of the state, of the slaves, because slaves at this time were considered property, not human beings that had the natural rights of life, liberty, and property, right? So if slaves were not counted, southern states would have fewer representatives in the House of Representatives than northern states. So what ended up happening was what is now known as the Three-Fifths Compromise. And this was a compromise between southern and northern states that for every five slaves, right, all five slaves would not be counted as part of the total population of the states, but only three of every five slaves would be counted as part of that state's population. So what this did was it gave, it gave slave states more representation, um, but for the northern side, northern states, not as much representation they would have had if all five were counted. Only three of every five were counted. So in this uh, chart, you can see that Virginia had free persons, 455,000, uh, but you had other persons that were counted at 293,000. So the total number in the census was 748,000, right? So you can see here that these were the totals that were counted, right? Other, other persons meaning, I think, slaves, right? So of this total, of this, they would distribute how many people, how many legislature, how many um, representatives that they can elect in the House of Representatives. So here is the Southern versus the Northern. The Southern, they wanted, um, for every five white citizens, they wanted five votes, right? And for five slaves, they wanted five votes. And for the Northern side, they wanted, um, for every five citizens, they had five votes. But for every five slaves, they had zero votes, right? So that slaves would not be counted um, as part of the census to get more representatives in Congress. So then they had a compromise. Um, 
And this was the three-fifths compromise, as I, as I explained. And this infographic, and this is figure 2.8 in your textbook, it shows the method proposed for counting slave populations in the resulting three-fifths compromise. So compromise number three was the national government's powers, right? The main concern during this time, and I've been sort of, you know, hitting this point again and again, was how to increase the authority of the national government, also known as the federal government, also known as the central government. These are all synonyms, remember? How to increase the authority of the national government while ensuring that it did not become too powerful. Because, again, uh, the American people, they wanted to keep power to the states, and they also wanted to keep power to individual people um, themselves because they didn't want their um, individual rights to be violated by a strong, by a get, by a big government. So how did the founding fathers resolve this? Um, the idea of how, what, what should be the role and how much power that they should give to the national government. So the founding fathers resolved this by giving power, a, a, a more power to the national government right, compared to the Articles of Confederation, which was very weak. They gave much more um, significant power over to the national government. But at the same time, they wanted to limit the government of the national power. So they did it by, number one, separation of powers. So they divided the national government into three different branches. And what are they? Executive, legislative, and judicial branch, right? They also wanted to make sure that there was a checks and balances. They gave, they gave each of the three branches of the national government the power to restrict the actions of the other two branches of government. And they also created a federal system of government, which gave power over to the national government, but they also gave power to each of the 13 state governments. So going into the separation of powers, Right, you have the executive, judicial, and legislative, and they gave different powers to each branch. Here in the executive branch, you can see, and this is figure 2.9 in your book, and the main point of this figure is that to prevent the national government or any one group within it to become too powerful, the Constitution divided the government into three branches with three powers. No branch can function without the cooperation of others, and each branch could restrict the power of others. So let's look at the executive branch. Right here, the president is the commander-in-chief of the, of the nation's armed forces. The president is responsible for conducting all foreign affairs. The president can appoint federal judges, ambassadors, and the heads of executive departments. The president can grant pardons to those who have, bro who have broken federal laws. And the president had the power to veto legislation passed by Congress. Okay, What about the judicial branch? Well, the Supreme Court hears cases involving federal law and the nation's final court of appeal. The Supreme Court had the power to declare laws and actions by the executive branch as unconstitutional so that they can strike down any laws, um, uh, strike down any laws. And the Chief Justice in the Supreme Court presides over any impeachment trials. And we saw that happen um, uh, in, in 2019 with impeachment of, um, of Trump. Um, here you have the legislative branch. And you have Congress has the power to pass legislation, meaning laws. Congress may declare war and the Senate has the power to ratify to approve treaties, international treaties that are signed by the president. The Senate must give its consent to the president's appointment of federal judges, ambassadors, and the heads of executive departments. And so even though the president can appoint and nominate, right, can nominate a judge, um, and we saw um, President Trump nominate two Supreme Court justices, it still had to be confirmed by the Senate. And, it had to be confirmed by a simple majority in the Senate, which is 50% plus one. So out of 100 senators, there needed to be 51 senators that approved the president's nomination, right? And Congress can impeach the president and remove 
him or her in office. So the impeachment is interesting because um, Congress is made up of the House of Representatives and the Senate, and you have to be impeached by the House of Representatives, which is just 50% um, of all members in the House of Representatives if they impeach the president and um, then it goes over to the Senate for a trial of impeachment of the president. And the final point is that Congress may establish the number of Supreme Court justices. Uh, right now we have nine. Um, and to also regulates the court's jurisdiction. Okay, so that's the separation of powers, but they also limited the government by making a checks and balances. So I it, we kind of went over it went over it in the separation of powers, but I'm just gonna um, just highlight that the executive branch is, is checked and balanced by these two branches because any executive orders that are written by the president is reviewed by the judicial branch and the judicial branch can strike down any executive orders that are unconstitutional. Um, at the same time, the judicial branch is dependent right, on the executive branch because exe the president can appoint some of court officials, can nominate judges, but at the same time, it doesn't have full power because any nomination of judges have to be confirmed and approved by the legislative branch, by Congress. And here, the con Congress can, can, can make laws and approve laws but it's, it doesn't have total power because the executive branch, the president in particular, can veto any legislation um, that's passed by Congress. But at the same time, uh, Congress can try to override a veto um, by a two-thirds vote if they feel very strongly about it. And that would require bipartisan support. Bipartisan support, meaning um, both Democrats and Republicans would have to have not just um, a, a simple majority to pass a law, but a much higher threshold, two-thirds vote to override a presidential veto. Okay, so you can see here that in this triangle uh, that these three branches make sure that the other two branches don't get too powerful, that they keep each other in check and there's a balance so that in theory all three branches would sort of have equal amount of power. So point number three, the federal system of government. Um, this was the idea that the strongest guarantee that the power and the power of the national government would be restricted and that states would retain a degree of sovereignty was the founding fathers creation of a federal system of government. So what is a federal system of government? The federal system of government is basically at the idea that we have a, on the left side of this, PowerPoint slide, a federal power, and also we have state power. Federal power, meaning power that we give to the national government or to the federal government, um, but also um, power over to each of the 13 states, and now we have 50 states, right? So here they gave different powers over to the federal and to the state. And on the left side here, the federal power uh, government given explicitly to the national government um, are, are known as enumerated powers and these include the power to declare war, impose taxes, to coin and regulate money, currency, to regulate foreign and interstate commerce, to raise and maintain an army and a navy, to maintain a post office, uh, to make treaties with foreign nations, foreign countries, and with the Native American tribes, and to make laws regulating the naturalization of immigrants for any sort of immigration policy. So that's these are the powers that belong to the national government. But what about state governments, right? And now we have 50 state governments. So these are known as reserve powers, all powers not given explicitly, not expressly given over to the national government were intended to be exercised by by the states, and these powers are known as reserve powers. And examples of this include intra-state commerce, intra meaning within the state, right? Any sort of business regulation, right? Taxes, um, right? That's within their territory of the 50, of this 50 states, individual states, right? Within the borders of their state, 
the state governments had the power to rule over and govern the people, right? Um, and this was also included right laws of marriage and the right to impose taxes. So question, what happens if there is a conflict of law between the state and national government? What if the national government is in direct conflict with state governments? And this federal system of government is, is quite unique because uh, let's say, let's take, you know, for example, um, the Korean government, right? Or the Japanese government. There's only one government. There's only the national government. There isn't, right? Like they don't have, they don't have different states broken up within the country of Korea that have their own autonomous independent power that conflicts with the national power, right? Um, so this federal system of government is quite interesting. So question, what happens if there's a conflict of, of laws between the state and national governments? Well, good question. Um, in this case, the national government, the national laws would win out, right? And this is known as the supremacy clause. So it says here, although states have a lot of power, the supremacy clause, and this is outlined in Article 6 of the Constitution, right? Um, it's, it states that laws passed by the Congress and treaties made by the federal government, what's another word for federal government? National government, what's another, another word for national government? Central government, these are all synonyms, again, um, that these treaties and laws made by Congress and by the federal government were the supreme law of the land, supreme meaning the best, superior, supreme, right? And that if there's a conflict, conflict of laws between the states and the national government, who will win? The national government wins. That the national government, the national laws are supreme, are the best, are the highest. That's what it's saying. So the Founding Fathers drafted a document with all these compromises, and this was called what is now known as the Constitution. Right? Here is a picture of the Constitution. Um, so they wrote it out. There's a preamble. We, the people of the United States, etc. And we have here, it's, it consists of seven articles, seven basically different ideas or paragraphs that you can think of, right? And then these are the people who signed onto um, the Constitution. So it consists of a preamble, seven articles. So what does the preamble say, right? This is what it says. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, union between what was originally the 13 states, to establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, tranquility meaning domestic uh, calm, calmness, right, and peace, provide for the common defense, provide for the common defense means provide for um, the military defense, promote the general welfare of its people, to secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. So what do each of the seven articles of the U.S. Constitution, what does it talk about? Well, in Article 1, it establishes the legislative branch, and it talks about the powers that's given over to the legislative branch. Article 2, it establishes and outlines the power of the executive branch. In Article 3, it's, it establish, establishes the powers of the judicial branch of our courts. Article four is it establishes the balance between the states and the federal government. So that's kind of like the federal system, right? Between the federal and national government vis-a-vis -vis compared to state governments. Article five describes how to amend and how to change the constitution. Article six establishes the constitution as the supreme law of the land. And Article 7, it lists the requirements to ratify the Constitution, to approve the Constitution, right? And how to have it accepted by each of the states. And at this time, there were 13 states. So let's talk about ratifying the Constitution. You remember this from maybe your high school you know, government class. But the rules of ratifying, approving the Constitution, right, and having this approved so that it has power over each of all the 13 um, states was set in Article, what was it? Article 7, you're right. 
and approval was needed from nine out of the 13 states for the Constitution to be formally adopted and for it to have power. Um, the U.S. Constitution was enacted ultimately in 1788 uh, because in 1788, New Hampshire became the ninth state to approve the Constitution, making it the law of the land. So here you can see a chronological from left to right, um, chronological uh, ratification of the Constitution. First you had Delaware, then Pennsylvania, then New Jersey, Georgia, Connecticut, Massachusetts, Maryland, South Carolina, and then finally the ninth state was New Hampshire. And then Virginia followed suit, New York, North Carolina, and last was Rhode Island. But in 1788, it was already ratified and it was the law of the land, right? And this was more, you know, out of default, right? But this timeline shows the, the order in which states ratified the new constitution. Small states would benefit from the protection of a larger union. Um, they ratified the constitution fairly quickly, such as Delaware and Connecticut. Larger, more populous states like Virginia and New York took a little bit longer. The last state to ratify the constitution was Rhode Island, the state that had always proven reluctant to act alongside the others. Fast fact, since ratification, the Constitution has been amended 27 times. So remember, the original Constitution didn't have uh, the 27 amendments. It was just the preamble and the seven articles, right? But since it ratified, um, they changed the, the Constitution a total of 27 times. So what was the amendment process? What was the process to change the Constitution? Well, it's very difficult to amend the Constitution, but we're able to do it 27 times, right? Uh, so far, 11,000 had been proposed, but only 27 has passed. And the first 10 amendments are known as what? If you said the Bill of Rights, you're correct. Um, it's known as the Bill of Rights, and these were added in 1791 to explicitly guarantee the basic civil liberties for American citizens. Uh, the Amer amendment process is on page 62 of your textbook, but these amendment proposals originate from Congress, and they have to be approved by two-thirds vote in both the House of Representatives and in the Senate. And it has to, and if three-fourths of state legislatures approve, then it becomes part of the Constitution, right? Um, what is three-fourths of 13? So let's, I'm gonna pull out my calculator. Um, three-fourths is what? 75%. So 75% times 13 was 9.75, which means you needed 10 states to ratify out of 13 for it to become, um, amend, to amend the Constitution. So now we have 50. So what is 75% times 50 states? Out of 50 states, you need 37.5. So you need 38 states to approve uh, an amendment for it to be a part of the Constitution, right? Um, to amend a law to be part of, um, to amend a law to be part of the Constitution, yes. So what was the Bill of Rights? The Bill of Rights are the first 10 amendments to the Constitution, and I'm just going to give a quick taste, right? Quick glance of the Constitution. First Amendment, uh, not of the Bill of Rights, First Amendment of the Bill of Rights. Constitution shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or of the right to right of the people to peaceably assemble and to, uh, and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. So basically it says that the government shall make no law barring the freedom of religion for there should be no establishment of an official religion and that free all people had the free exercise to practice their own religion. Um, people also had the freedom of speech. They also had freedom of, freedom of press to be able to write, write and publish what they want and the freedom of assembly uh, to, to meet together and to protest and to organize and to petition the government. What is the Second Amendment? Second Amendment is a well-regulated militia being necessary to, 
to the security of a free state, the right of people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. So this is the idea that people can own guns. The Third and Fourth Amendment um, put limits on the executive. It said that the government may not arbitrarily take a individual's home for a militia. Um, so the army can't just take someone's house and live in it, right? That's what they did, um, what the British army did. So the American people, they wanted to make sure that that wouldn't happen. That the government cannot engage in unreasonable searches and seizures of evidence that they must have probable cause. The Fifth and Eighth Amendment dealt with individuals and and de with dealing with the court that individuals had the right to a speedy and public and fair trial, that they know the charges that are made against them, <clears throat> and to confront their accusals, accusers and hostile witnesses, and that, that they had the right to counsel. They had immunity from testifying um, against oneself and to, to incriminate against yourself. Individuals also had the right from, of immunity from more than one trial of the same offense, uh, not have their property taken without compensation, and that bail is not excessive, and to be free from cruel and unusual punishment. The Ninth and Tenth Amendment um, put limits on the national government. It was the idea, the Ninth Amendment was that all rights that are not listed, explicitly listed in the Constitution, belong to um, the people, and it belongs to the state. So how to remember the Bill of Rights? Okay, we're gonna. I'm gonna show you a quick video of how to remember the Bill of Rights. I, I. Um, let's see. Let's click on this. Hello everyone. This is a quick, easy way to remember the Bill of Rights. Which amendment is which out of the first ten? Not how to memorize each one. For that, see some of my other videos. But. This is a quick, easy way to remember the first ten amendments. First amendment, one, put okay. up. I'm actually not going to show that video here, but I'm going to link that video below, and I definitely want you to take a look at that because um, that video will help you remember, um, help you memorize all ten um, amendments of the Bill of Rights. Okay, so definitely. Uh, watch that. It's really fun, really easy, and a lot of my previous students have really enjoyed that and used a lot of the tricks um, of that video to memorize and do well on the exam. Here we have the amendments 11 through 27. So this is not part of the Bill of Rights because the Bill of Rights is only 1 through 10 and these are 11 through 27. Um, real quick, the 11th is about lawsuits against states. 12 is elections of executives, 13th, so you have slavery, slavery abolished, 14th is civil rights, 15th had to do with the right to vote, um, 16th was income tax, 17 is the direct election of senators, 18 was prohibition um, of drinking, uh, 19th is women's suffrage, the right for women to vote, 20th, 20th amendment was lame duck sessions. 21st is repeal the prohibition so that people can have the right to drink alcohol. 22 was to limit presidential terms to two years. 23rd was voting in the District of Columbia. 24th was the abolition of poll taxes. Poll meaning um, you don't have to pay, it doesn't cost anything to vote in an election. 25th is presidential disability and secession. 18, 26th is the right for 18 year olds to vote and 27th was congressional pay. So the 11th amendment more clearly defines the original jurisdiction of the Supreme Court concerning a suit brought against a state by a citizen of another state. The 12th amendment redefines how the president and vice president are chosen um, through the electoral college and that the two positions are cooperative rather than um, rather than just getting just being the highest vote getters. So now, as you see in current day, the president and the vice like the president, the presidential candidate names their vice presidential candidate. Right. And they run they run on a ticket. They run as a team. Right. But before then, different people to run and the highest vote 
vote getter would become president and the second highest vote getter would be vice president. And if you do that, sometimes two people who hate each other or two, two, two people from different political parties would win. And you don't want that, right? For the executive branch, you wanted a team, right? Because when the first president would, you know, needs help, you know, the vice president is there. And also if the first president were to die, the second, the vice president would take over, right? So must be eligible, and also ensures that anyone who becomes vice president must be eligible to become president. The 13th Amendment abolished slavery in the United States. The 14th Amendment ensured that all citizens of all states had not only rights on the federal level, but on the state level too. It removed the, the three-fifth counting of slaves in the, in the census and ensured that the United States would not pay for debts of rebellious states. The 15th Amendment ensures that race cannot be used as a criteria for voting. Um, the 16th Amendment authorizes the United States to collect income tax without regard to the population of the states. The 17th Amendment shifted to the choosing of senators from state legislatures to the people of the states. The 18th Amendment abolished the, the sale or manufacture of alcohol in the United States. The amendment was later repealed repealed meaning taken back or erased. The 19th Amendment ensures that gender cannot be used as a criteria for voting. Simply said, women can now vote. 20th Amendment set new start dates for the terms of Congress and the president and clarifies how the debts of president before swearing in would be handled. The 21st Amendment repealed the 18th Amendment, um, and that was a prohibition. Um, for alcohol. The 22nd Amendment sets a limit to the number of times a president can be elected. It was two four-year terms. The 23rd Amendment grants that the District of Columbia, which is known as Washington, D.C., had the right to three electors in the presidential elections. Um, the 24th Amendment ensured that no tax could be charged to vote in any federal office. 25th Amendment clarifies even further, the line of secession to the presidency um, and establishes rules for a president who becomes unable to perform his duties while in office, right? After the president dies, who becomes the president, vice president, after the vice president, who's next in line, speaker of the house, and so on and so forth, right? The 26th Amendment guarantees that any person 18 years or over may vote. And finally, the 27th Amendment requires that any law that increase the pay of legislatures may not take effect until after an election. Okay, so here are the key takeaway questions um, that I want you guys to answer. And all these questions are listed in assignments um, on the tab on the left. So the first question is, what are the five freedoms in the First Amendment, right? First Amendment is in the Bill of Rights. And again, it's the freedom of religion, speech, petition, assembly, um, and press, right? So go ahead and write those down. Why did colonists break away from the British? What events led up to the American Revolution? Okay, go ahead and look back at my slides. Um, there were a couple of different reasons, right? <clears throat> you can write down just a couple of the main ones. Number three, where, where do the ideas and values of the Declaration of Independence and Constitution come from? It came from a political philosopher. Who was it? And what were some of the main ideas that he outlined? What were the weaknesses of the, we of the Articles of Confederation versus vis-a-vis -vis the Constitution? What were some of those weaknesses, right? We talked, we listed them out. What was the Great Compromise? You can list them. And yes, there are three, but I kind of want you to not just write um, slavery, representation, and the role of government. Kind of you know, show me that you've understood by giving me maybe a sentence or two what, what those compromises actually was. Don't just write slavery. What was the compromise on slavery, right? What was the compromise on um, representation in the government? What was, um, yeah, so go into a bit of detail. Um, not, not too crazy, but just enough to show me that you understood. Um, Number six, how did the Founding Fathers increase the authority of the national government while ensuring it did not become too powerful? Again, this is, you know, because the Articles of Confederation were too weak, they wanted to make sure that the Constitution 
um, was a lot more powerful. So they increased the power of the national government, also known as the federal government or the central government. But they also wanted to limit the power of the national government. How? Right? Um, there were three things. I'll just give you the first one to make sure you guys understand it. One was the separation of power. What were the other two? And what did, what is the separation of power? And give me like maybe a sentence or two, what that actually means. <clears throat> what happens if there's a conflict between national and state law? Which law wins? What is it called? The blank clause. What was that? Number eight, what are the Bill of Rights? And name them in order, right? And you can look at the video um, to just write down what they were. How many amendments are there in total? And I don't want you to tell me all 27 amendments, but I just picked out four uh, main amendments that I definitely want you to remember, right? What was the main idea behind the 13th Amendment? 15th Amendment, 19th Amendment, and the 26th Amendment. And these 13, 15, 19, 26, these are amendments that if you read in newspapers, they'll they'll talk about these amendments, right? And these are just common knowledge amendments that a lot of people know and remember, right? Um, for example, the 19th Amendment, right? Um, that gave women the right to vote. People will just call it the 19th Amendment or people will write signs like, I love the 19th Amendment and stuff like that. Or even, what is the Second Amendment? People don't say it's the right to vote. Like they just say Second Amendment. I love the Second Amendment, stuff like that. Like these are just common knowledge amendments that you should be aware of and know. Um, so I put those on there and that's it. Um, that's the end of lecture. So see you next time. Bye guys.